Q&A at the end. Um, so welcome to the seminar. It's called From a Distance, Sex, Intimacy and Technology During COVID-19. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and cultures. I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, also, before we begin, I would like to thank the supporters of the seminar today, and there's, there's a couple of them. So firstly, this seminar was organised through the Gender, Sexuality and hu Human Rights theme in the Transforming Human Societies Research Focus Area Group. So I'd like to thank um, the people um, in that group, particularly the director, Dr Tim Jones. Um, the seminar was also supported by the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, who provided some funding to, to help us with this, um, and also supported by the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University, um, um, who are helping us with the tech today. So particularly, I would like to um, thank Henry Von Dusa and Nicole Eckersley and Ivy McGowan. Thank you for your help. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Jennifer Power. I I am um, a research fellow at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University um, and have organised um, this seminar today in collaboration with a couple of different people. Um, so just to go back to the title, From a Distance, Sex, Intimacy and Technology, I have to say I have had Bette Midler in my head for days every time I look at this screen from a distance. So I apologise to anyone who goes away with that song in their head. No disrespect to Bet, but that song's getting tiring. Um, God is not watching us, I suspect, but you know, something we can talk about. Um, but it is pertinent, like uh, in particular, because this sort of physical distance between people has really what, been what inspired the seminar today. Um, you know, we were very much aware that the COVID-19 social lockdowns have imposed um, this physical distance that's required people to communicate much more regularly through technology such as we are doing today. Um, so this felt pertinent to a lot of work researchers in the fields of gender and sexuality studies have been doing in recent years, really looking at the role of new technologies in facilitating and shaping human sexual intimacy and human intimacy more broadly. So it felt timely given COVID-19 to hold a seminar to talk about this but also to reflect more broadly on the role that many technologies, both old and new technologies, and not necessarily just digital technologies, play in mediating human sexuality and in connecting humans. So often these technologies, I think, are not the ones that you would expect. It's not necessarily just a telephone or a computer or a new social media app that connects people or shapes the nature of human connection. I think often it's much more mundane technologies like um, you know, coffee or alcohol or the kitchen table or the design of a sofa or the layout of a restaurant. You know, there's everyday technologies that have forever been informing and shaping and mediating human intimacy. So our aim with this technology is to really cast a broad lens on the, the place and the role of technologies in shaping and mediating human intimacies with a nod to COVID-19. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce our three speakers. Um, first up today, we will be hearing from Professor Suzanne Fraser, who's the Director of the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society here at La Trobe University. Um, we're also going to hear from Dr Amanda Gesselman, who's from the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University in the USA, and from Dr Jamie Hakim, who's at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, it did strike me that one of the, the, the benefits, I think, of social lockdowns is that virtual seminars with international guests suddenly seem more doable. Um, we're all much more used to meeting online. It seems more everyday and, and simpler. But that said, I really would like to acknowledge that there are, there are still time zone factors in place and that for Amanda, it is midnight. And for Jamie, it is just short of 5 a.m. or just after 5 a.m. Um, so I really would like to thank Amanda and Jamie for, for being flexible with their schedule so they could join us today. Um, so just the process for today, um, I'm going to invite each speaker to present and I'll, and I'll introduce them properly before their presentations. And then we will have time, I think about half an hour, we've got uh, a total of an hour and a half today. So about half an hour at the end to invite questions from the audience. Um, we will be doing that via the chat function, although I do ask you to hold off until the end so that 
we're sort of not inundated with questions throughout the presentation. And then I'll, I'll sort of moderate the chat. So I'll, 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 I'll grab questions and, and throw them to the speakers for us. Um, but to get us started, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So, um, sorry, I've just lost your bio in amidst my mess of papers here on my kitchen table. Um, our first speaker today is Professor Suzanne Fraser. So as mentioned, Suzanne is the director of the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society, which we like to call ARCHES at La Trobe University here in Melbourne. Um, she's also a visiting pros professorial fellow at the Centre for Social Research and Health at the University of New South Wales. Um, Suzanne has a PhD in gender studies and is also the author of several books um, which have focused on the body and health in society and, uh, in society and culture. Her most recent book is, is entitled Habits, Remaking Addiction, which is co-authored with David Moore and Helen Keane. And her previous work covers a range of topics, including cosmetic surgery, methadone maintenance treatment, the politics of hepatitis C and the politics of addiction. Over the last few years, Professor Fraser's research has focused on exploring injecting practices and harm reduction needs among men who inject performance and image enhancing drugs and on impediments to the uptake and diffusion in Australia of take home naloxone. Um, so Suzanne, I'll hand over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen and you should be able to share yours. Thanks very much, Jen. I'll, I'll go ahead and share. I think it takes a moment to come up, but um, while I am waiting, um, I'll just say thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited about today's session and I think it is fantastic that we have a group of speakers that includes two overseas speakers. I'm very thankful to them as well for um, giving up some sleep, no doubt, to be here with us today. Can I assume that slide's now visible, Jen? Um, I can't see the slide actually. I can see. Okay, let me just try again. Oh, it's starting to come okay, up now, I think. Great, right. Yep, there we go. You can see it now. Okay, um, okay, well, as has been said many times before, technology is a part of who we are. They help shape our lives in um, lots of ways, including our forms of intimacy. How this relationship works is I think really worthy of close consideration. In this short presentation, I wanna draw on a couple of examples where technology and intimacy are entangled in unexpected ways. In talking about them, I'll also point to some theoretical resources I've found helpful in understanding technology and thinking experimentally about its role in human relationships, social dynamics, and political problems such as those I'm going to focus on here, things that are commonly called drug-related harms. Over the years, I've found feminist science studies and science and technology studies really great resources for my work. They come from different places, but both ask us to reconsider our assumptions about what counts as technology and where the line is drawn between technology and other phenomena such as nature or art. In turn, that raises important political questions and proposes new accounts of agency and causation. As philosopher of science and technology, Bruno Latour has argued, technologies aren't just passive neutral tools that can be deployed to fulfill our goals, nor are they governing devices that dictate use and outcomes. Instead, they create what he calls affordances opportunities and tendencies. When I started uh, many years ago to research sexuality, blood bond virus prevention and drug use, these dynamics relating to technology and affordances immediately started to become clear to me. Contemporary life offers an array of technological means of reaching for and enjoying intimacy. Those means are also routinely mobilized for ends that would seem not to have been intended or predicted by the makers and which might also diminish intimacy, at least for some people. In the process, the very terms of the engagement between technology and intimacy might be redefined. 
the nature of intimacy itself, for example, is undergoing change in response to the advent of social media, particularly under current pandemic related restrictions. And some of those changes will take a while to become properly visible. For me, the multi-directional, unpredictable, yet far from arbitrary relationship between technology and intimacy forms a thread that runs throughout most of my work. I wanna offer a couple of examples of this thread here, then briefly draw on some of the ideas and issues that emerge when these examples are considered. My first example relates to an article some colleagues and I wrote on the safer injecting fit pack with the design of the fit pack understood as materializing a particular approach to intimacy. The second example looks at an article that covers a case in which the overdose reversal medication naloxone is used within an intimate relationship to afford care for a person with a terminal illness. In both cases, the two technologies, injecting fit packs and take home naloxone, bear directly on the production of intimacy, but not in predictable or obvious ways. By looking at these examples, I'll be able to outline, I think, in a bit more detail, the ideas about affordance I mentioned a minute ago. It could be that those ideas are also of use to researchers working in other areas and may be of interest to uh, people attending today. In the West, the majority of injecting equipment sharing is thought to occur between sexual partners. Despite this, the uh, responsibility for avoiding bloodborne virus transmission has long been conceived as an individual one. Prevention measures are um, such as the distribution of sterile injecting equipment, such as in, uh, injecting packs or fit packs, are aimed at individuals. And there's little regard really for the social and legal context of injecting in that process. In the article I'm talking about here, we drew on the work of Latour to reconceptualize the fit pack. We argued that the fit pack isn't uh, neutral in its meanings or effects, that instead it affords particular meanings and actions. For example, that injecting is an individual practice and safety and individual responsibility. To challenge these affordances, our team led by Professor Carla Trelaw developed a new FitPAC prototype aimed at couples. Um, and along with that came some related health promotion messages. This wasn't uh, anything very complicated, just a different kind of fit safe box with more chambers, more equipment, and a perforated breakable join, um, along with new labels and messaging that spoke directly to couples, their relationships, and the positives and negatives of sharing of different kinds within relationships. Uh, we did some couples based interviews with people who tried the new fit packs and they indicated that these new fit packs could afford couples oriented safer injecting and at the same time better recognition of relationships that are often dismissed by researchers and healthcare providers as merely drug use driven and therefore insincere. The, the findings we um, produced demonstrated that Recognition should be given to the role of technological objects in materializing particular meanings, or as um, Latour might put it, informing the mass of particular moralities. He has an idea um, that he uh, talks about as the missing mass of moralities, where technological objects uh, materialize certain moralities or ethics and politics. And we, um, it, these findings allowed us uh, to in turn interrogate the meanings and moralities invested in or materialized in the technological object of the fit pack to see how things might be changed or improved. So to sum up that example, material objects such as safe injecting fit packs aren't merely utilitarian tools embodying singular intentions and allowing singular outcomes. 
their multiple in their uses and effects, entangled in broader contexts of politics, meaning, constraint and use. Fit packs can reduce the transmission of bloodborne viruses, but they can also, for example, make ideas about relationships and intimacy in different ways. They can give recognition to relationships that are otherwise marginalised or denigrated. And in turn, they can also shape practices of healthcare and harm reduction services. One of the outcomes of the research project was some awareness among uh, service providers that um, working with couples uh, might be useful in some contexts. In my second example related to a different project, um, my team explored the ways in which the overdose reversal medication naloxone, also known by its product name Narcan, is sometimes used within intimate relationships to enact particular kinds of care. In an article led by Dr. Adrian Ferrugia, we talked about uh, the use of naloxone in intimate relationships between people who inject drugs. How does naloxone work? If someone consumes too much of an opioid, such as the pain medication oxycodone or the illicit opioid uh, heroin, and they stop breathing, naloxone can be used to revive them. Conventionally, this has been done by medical professionals. Take home naloxone initiatives are made up of a range of programs and practices that allow people who consume opioids or their friends and families to use the naloxone outside clinical settings. So the second example of technologically afforded intimacy I wanna focus on today emerges from an interview about the use of take home naloxone, which was conducted with someone we'll call Gabrielle, that's not her real name of course, a nurse. Gabrielle and her terminally ill partner, Jeremy, live together and both consume opioids, including heroin. Gabrielle is very experienced with take home naloxone, having administered it many times to different people. In her interview, uh, Gabrielle described a complex arrangement that she and uh, Jeremy uh, developed um, because his cancer involves chronic pain and a higher than normal susceptibility to overdose. As um, Gabrielle explains, Jeremy consumes opioids in part to manage his cancer related pain. She says, sometimes he gets very, very intoxicated and he'll start forgetting to breathe. So that's when I give him Narcan. I don't always give him a full ampule. I don't want, I don't wait until he's stopped breathing. Sometimes I'm just trying to reverse some of the opioid opiate effect. So I give him a third of an ampule and that brings him out of it enough for me not to worry about him not breathing. Gabrielle and Jeremy have an agreement that governs how and when naloxone is used. As Gabrielle puts it, we've talked about it and made decisions like a commitment to each other. Here the use of the overdose reversal technology naloxone takes shape within a specific set of caring relationships where Gabrielle carefully watches over Jeremy. If necessary, she painstakingly titrates the dose of naloxone to make sure he isn't at risk of stopping breathing, while also making sure she doesn't reverse the positive effects of the opioids at the same time. We can see here how take-home naloxone affords, uh, affords a specific regime of intimate care and itself is shaped by those specific relations of intimacy. Okay, to sum up briefly, some key concepts I've used here in conceptualising the relationship between technology and intimacy are affordance, entanglement, and technology as the materialisation or mass of moralities. Both of my examples involve technologies that viewed within the context in which they were developed are simply harm reduction measures. But recognising that they materialise certain moralities and relate to intimate relationships in specific value-laden ways is extremely important. Understanding the action of technologies as one of affordance and entanglement entails a range of other understandings. Affordance alerts us to the way 
the intentions behind the creation of the technology may be challenged and exceeded and its conventional function might be set aside or leveraged for new purposes. The morality uh, embodied in the so-called mass of the technology may be challenged or subverted through conscious action or through unpredictable effects of multiple entangled agencies. Here, the causal action of, uh, um, sorry, here the causal agencies at work in creating certain outcomes are recognised as distributed across actors that include the technological object, the legal and political context, the social unit address, so for example, the individual or the couple, and the persons using it. By taking all these elements into account and understanding them as mutually constitutive, we can open up ways of seeing what technologies already do and could do, and where previously ignored agencies exist, affording new possibilities and futures in the process. Thank you. And I'll just uh, uh, put up a slide with some acknowledgements. Thanks very much, Jen. Thanks, Suzanne, that was great. Um, I'll just um, remind everyone that we'll be taking questions after we've heard from all our speakers. So if you have questions for Suzanne, please just note them down and you can, you can um, ask Suzanne at the end after we've heard from the three speakers. Um, and I would just like to introduce our second speaker for today, Dr. Amanda Gesselman. So Amanda is a social psychologist at the Kinsey Institute Sorry, I've noticed I've, I keep switching between first names and the formal professors and doctors. So just forgive me on that. Everyone holds both identities, I'm sure. So Amanda Gesselman is a social psychologist at the Kinsey Institute and the inaugural Anita Aldrich, hope I'm pronouncing that right, endowed research scientist at Indiana University in the USA. Dr Gesselman's research examines dating and sexuality of single adults with an emphasis on technology and health behaviours, the psychology, sexuality and health of romantic couples, and also the intersection of human development, stigma and sexuality. And once again, thank you to Amanda for joining us at midnight from your home in the USA. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I feel like this is going to be um, quite a change from the previous presentation, but I hope that it will um, interest all of you. So let me go ahead and share uh, my screen. Okay. I think that you can see this. I hope so. Okay, so um, today I'm going to present some work that I've um, that I've been doing since March with some of my collaborators, Dr. Justin Garcia, Justin LaMiller, and Kristen Mark, all from the US, um, all affiliated with the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. And we've been doing this study since March, um, March 20th actually of this year, which is when the um, lockdown or the safe at home recommendations went into effect in the US, which I know is um, a bit later than everyone else, but we might be doing our, some of us are doing our best. Um, so in this study, we, it's still ongoing. Um, we currently have three complete waves of data collection. And the first one was fielded in March, uh, in late March, 2020. And then waves two and three came two weeks and four weeks after that. And then we have waves four through 10 that are coming at one month intervals. So today I'll be talking about waves um, one, two, and three, which are now complete. So the way that we recruited the participants for this study, um, which, sorry, I have skipped, is about love and sex in the time of COVID-19. Um, so this was specifically, it is specifically a study about um, how people are um, connecting, how people's relationships are going, considering that we are um, either in lockdown with a partner or in lockdown separated from our partners, and also how single people are navigating these times where um, we're not allowed to uh, connect in the same way that we have been before. Um, you're not allowed to go to someone for physical comfort. You're not allowed to have face-to-face -face, um, interactions that we have, we've sought throughout all of, all of human history to provide us with that comfort and safety and um, feelings of belongingness. So we've been conducting this study for a few months now and we've recruited our sample of participants mostly through social media. So this is a large convenience sample and um, we recruited people through the Kinsey Institute social media accounts, and then it was shared through um, 
tons of individual people and also um, organizations dedicated to sexual health and sexuality, et cetera. This is important because the sample turns out to be quite different from um, what most samples would be in terms of um, gender and sexual orientation and I think probably um, feelings about sexuality. So it, um, I think that it's probably a very liberal sample compared to most, um, most other studies done in the field but probably a, um, an effect of our, where we sampled from. So right now we had, we started with um, almost 3,000 adults in T1 and that has decreased to about 888 um, in T3. We're currently conducting T4 and we have a pretty good response rate, but um, it has been slowly decreasing as, as is expected. Um, our mean age is 32 years, and this is an international sample, although half of them are from the United States. Um, it actually has a pretty good uh, racial or ethnic um, spread, where only 60% of the sample is white, whereas in other studies, usually convenient samples are much higher. Um, we do have uh, about half men, half women, although about one third of our sample has identified as transgender, which is um, a pretty huge percentage compared to previous samples, and we're actually very excited about this to, um, to be able to dig in and present work on transgender individuals because um, this is quite lacking in a lot of prior literature. Um, not that I'm going to show you any data about this today, but almost all of our sample had not received a COVID-19 diagnosis, and 96% of them were asymptomatic at C1. So I'm just gonna present a little bit of this data today because I only have um, 10 minutes and our survey is quite long. But some of our tech-related questions that we were specifically interested in were um, surrounded, or were focused on um, online dating and the incorporation of technology into their sex lives. So we wanted to know, now that people are, um, you know, locked in and can't necessarily uh, interact face-to-face, -face, is online dating increasing? And if so, um, what kinds of changes are happening? Are people using it more? Are they checking it more often? And what do they think or what have they observed other people doing on those platforms as well? Our second question was about incorporating technology into your sex life. So we asked participants to report on um, a, a large list between uh, 60 and 100 behaviors, depending on which wave. Um, we had people report on whether or not they had engaged in these behaviors since the pandemic began and if they were new, if it was the first time that they had done this. So we wanted to know how they were incorporating this into their sex lives, how many people are doing new, um, new additions or new incorporations, and what are they doing. And the last one, I um, am particularly interested in loneliness. I'm um, very much interested in social connection and making meaningful connections, um, how people stay socially connected, how that impacts their mental and physical health. So I was particularly interested in, in looking at loneliness now that we're um, in lockdown. And so our last question was, are people who are lonelier during, um, during lockdown or during home lock-ins engaging with tech more often in these ways? So specifically looking at online dating, at least in the US, there are a lot of advertisements for online dating companies, online dating platforms um, that are saying that people are using these more often, that there's been a sharp increase in use, um, that uh, more and more people are signing up, et cetera. And while some companies have come out and said this, other companies have um, released statements saying that that's not true, that, you know, that only a subset of people are using this or, you know, whatever way that they're cutting the data. Um, it seems to be quite a nuanced discussion, at least here. And so we're really interested in seeing whether or not that was true. Um, and the answer is that actually, at least in our sample, online dating is not increasing. People aren't using them more or more often. Um, so at T1, which again is in late March, about 26% of our participants were using online dating. And that's decreased by about a percentage or two at each time point. So it's relatively stable or decreasing, but certainly not increasing, at least in our sample. Um, we asked them how often they check their apps. So we had, um, it was a scale from um, a, once a week or a few times a week to um, multiple times a day. And over half of the sample reported that they check their apps at least once a day with um, most of this percentage reporting multiple times a day. And this decreased to just 53% at T2 and T3. So just a very slight decrease, probably not um, statistically significant. 
although about one in three of them reported sending more messages than they had before. So they are engaging with it more in that capacity, although not necessarily um, spending more time looking at the apps. Um, so uh, it might be that they're using their time more efficiently. So they're signing in less, but um, trying to connect with people um, at a greater rate. Our next question was what behavioral changes are happening. So again, we asked participants about their own behavior and then we asked them what um, other people are doing, what they've noticed that other people that are on the same platforms are doing or engaging in whatever capacity. Um, so about one in three reported that um, they're being contacted by people that they wouldn't have expected. So people who um, are more attractive or less attractive, people who are interested in different things. Um, these people are reporting that they um, receive messages from people that they wouldn't have met in person otherwise, or that they wouldn't have messaged themselves. Um, and the same percentage are receiving more messages than they did from before the pandemic. So there is an increase in both sending and receiving. Um, and about half of the sample also reported that people are more active than they used to be. So there does seem to be, although um, our data doesn't support an increase, there does seem to be um, a bit more activity, um, again, maybe using it more efficiently. Um, there also seems to be some changes in the way that people are interacting with each other in terms of um, what they're looking for, what they're putting off. So 28% reported that they're noticing people are more friendly than they were before. They're, they're warmer now. Um, they want to uh, engage in deeper conversation. They want to get to know you more. However, 39% reported that um, people overwhelmingly seem uh, more sexually interested or hornier now. So it seems to be that people's online dating behavior, um, the largest increases that we see are in the sexual domain, not necessarily the emotional domain. So while people are using it to reach out to others, it, um, it at least from our participants perspective and in the other data, it seems that a lot of that is stemming from sexual desire rather than um, the desire to have a um, 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 an emotional relationship or romantic connection. Our next question was about incorporating technology into our sex lives. And we actually just got this paper published, um, which I should have put a uh, citation here. And I forgot considering how new it is. Um, but we were really interested in looking at how people are incorporating technology um, in whatever capacity into their sex lives. And again, as a new addition during the pandemic. So what we found was that 20% of people said that they had um, incorporated something new in their sex lives. And the top inclusions were by and large sexting. That was the number one way that people were um, engaging in a, new, in a new fashion or in a new, um, with a new technology, et cetera. Sexting was by and away number one, um, followed by sending nude photos, which is again, probably um, sexting, but maybe not, maybe they don't define it as that. The third was having cyber sex. So um, this was um, um, having this with a stranger or someone you know, but um, having this sexual interaction via text only. And this is all text space and in real time. They're also searching for sex or sexual health information online, filming themselves masturbating and also having phone sex. Um, so we saw increases in all of these and um, these were consistently reported at each time, um, each time point, T1, 2, and 3. So we asked about new additions at each one. And um, obviously, uh, these were different people who said, yes, this was brand new for me in the past two weeks. But these were consistently the newest, the, the most reported new additions. So um, this seems to be the pattern for when people start to add new things. And last, the impact of loneliness and tech use. So again, um, safe at home recommendations or lockdown uh, is likely to facilitate these higher levels of loneliness because we can't see people face to face. We can't touch um, our loved ones uh, who are not quarantining, quarantining with us, et cetera. Um, and so I personally was really interested in this to see um, you know, what the long-term effects will, of this will be. And what we found was that First, higher loneliness at each wave was associated with higher loneliness at every other wave. So higher loneliness at the beginning was associated with even more loneliness at T2 and at T3. Um, so lonelier people generally are staying lonely. Um, it, it seems to be quite consistent across waves. 
And at T1, we did find that lonelier participants were engaging with online dating platforms more. Um, they were checking them more frequently. They were spending more time in terms of minutes um, each day. Um, they were sending more messages. They were just fully engaging with it more than less lonely people. But this was actually only found at T1, at T2 and T3. And from the preliminary results in T4, there's actually no relation with loneliness and online dating anymore. Um, it seems to have disappeared, although it was um, a, a moderate to large effect in the um, in T1. So it seems that while lonelier people were doing this at the beginning, now everyone's people of all levels of loneliness are doing this or um, or no one is doing, you know, people are not doing this. Um, and loneliness was related to adding new things to their sex lives. Um, so sexting, phone sex, cyber sex, etc. But this was only a small effect. And this was at every time wave. So in conclusion, all this is very much ongoing um, and the pandemic is ongoing, especially in the United States. Um, we expect behaviors to continue to shift um, either positively or negatively. However, so far we have found um, a stability or a slight decrease in online dating. Although users are reporting an increase in um, interactions, they're sending and receiving more messages, they're feeling more warmth from people, more friendliness, and there is a slight shift towards having more meaningful conversations or um, asking more questions to get to know each other. However, it does seem that the sexual aspect of online dating is outweighing the emotional aspect right now. Um, people tend, people seem to think that others are um, more sexually motivated than they are to be romantically motivated. And that might be turning people away. That might be why we see a slight decrease. Um, around 20% were incorporating technology into their sex lives um, with these new additions. And this was largely in the form of sexting um, or creating content. So taking photos of yourself, taking videos, um, masturbation videos, especially. Um, we have started to work on the, um, the upcoming surveys, T5, T6, etc. And we're trying to think of ways to look at um, the potential benefits that could come from this, the positive aspects of engaging in sexual exploration, sexual expression in these new ways that might not have, um, they might not have been thought of before. And finally, loneliness was related to engagement with tech, but only slightly with these new tech additions and only with online dating at T1. Um, so while the sexual aspect of online dating might be more prevalent, um, it seems that emotional intimacy is lacking and that might be turning these lonelier people away from this outlet that might have been, um, that could have otherwise been helpful for them. So we are um, very much going to follow the trajectory, trajectory of loneliness throughout all of our um, other time points and try to look at the ways that people are um, attempting to engage with others, if not through online dating. So thanks to everyone for attending. Um, my collaborators are Justin Garcia, Justin Miller, and Kristen Mark. And we received funding recently for this study, for the future waves of this study through our Office of the Vice President for Research at Indiana University. So I'd like to thank them as well. Um, and thank you all for having me. Thank you, that was, that was excellent. And I, I have lots of questions and I imagine that other people do as well. So as I mentioned, hold on to those. We'll hear from Jamie and then um, hopefully um, hear a bit more from Amanda soon in the question time. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Jamie Hakim, who is lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia, where he has been since uh, 2014. So Dr. Hakim's research interests lie at the intersection of digital media, intimacy, embodiment, gender and sexuality. And he explores these themes in his recent book, Work That Body, Male Bodies in Digital Culture. Um, this book looks at the recent rise of different types of men using digital technologies to sexualize their bodies, arguing that they do this as a way of negotiating, living through this post 2008 neoliberalism period. Um, Dr. Hakim is the principal investigator on the Economic and Social Research Council funded project called Digital, Digital Intimacies, how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Jamie. Thank you for, thank you for being here today. Uh, thanks, Jen. Thanks for that. Um, and thank you for, for organising what's already kind of proving a really fascinating uh, seminar. Um, and thanks to uh, Amanda and Suzanne, those were both kind of uh, fascinating and both feed into the sorts of things that I'll be saying now. 
Um, I haven't got any slides. You're just going to see um, my head, uh, unfortunately for you. But uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll go. Um, so yeah, as, as Jen said, I'm um, a lecturer in media studies at UEA in the UK. Um, I'm also the principal investigator on an ESRC funded project called Digital Intimacies. Um, and we are an interdisciplinary project drawing on expertise in cultural studies, sociology of health and social anthropology, hoping to make a two pronged intervention into contemporary understandings of how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. So the first intervention um, we hope to make is to look beyond current preoccupations with gay men, uh, gay and bi men, casual sex and hookup apps, and by focusing more generally on smartphone use to capture the multiplicity of intimacies practiced by these men. Secondly, we want to situate these smartphone mediated intimacies more fully within the social and cultural contexts in which they occur. So in today's talk, I'll be concentrating on this second focus by speaking about the approach that we're taking when we try and understand these smartphone mediated intimacies within their wider social and cultural contexts. And that context being the time of the coronavirus pandemic. So this approach is called conjunctural analysis and it was developed at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham under the directorship of Stuart Hall in the 1970s. Um, the term conjuncture refers to a period of time, specifically referencing the arrangement of social forces during that period of time. So looking at the relationship between the economic, the social, the cultural, the political, the technological, and so on. Um, so looking at all these together and how they're arranged during a particular kind of historical period. Conjunctural analysis was developed in response to debates that were taking place in Marxist theory in Britain in the 1960s over the role that the economic had in determining the arrangement of a particular conjuncture. So against the economic determinism of what Raymond Williams calls vulgar Marxism, in which the economic determines the final uh, shape of the conjuncture, the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies argued that all the social forces had equal capacity to determine that conjuncture in complex and unpredictable ways. There were similar debates around technological determinism, especially in Williams's book on television, in which he critiques Marshall McLuhan's approach to technology and historical change. And there's no time to get into these today. Suffice to say, what it means for our project is that we are, as I've said, considering the ways that gay men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy within the wider set of conjunctural relations they're doing it in. We have therefore organized the project into three strands. Firstly, we plan on interviewing 40 gay and bisexual men in London, Edinburgh and the east of Scotland about how they use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. Secondly, we're looking into a range of documents to ascertain the material context in which they do this, looking at, for example, changes in the gay scene, access to sexual health and the broader economic and political contexts in which all this takes place. And finally, we're analysing pop cultural representations of smartphone mediated intimacies, looking at TV uh, programmes, uh, journalism, uh, internet memes and so on, to analyse the discourses which are available to these men to make sense of their own smartphone mediated intimate practices. The intention is to integrate the data collected from these different strands in order to arrive at our final analysis. So we're almost halfway through the project and have yet to carry out the interviews. So I can't imagine what this might be yet. So what I'll do in the remainder of this presentation is outline some emerging thoughts and questions that we at the project are thinking about at this stage. And in doing so, hopefully make the case for the value of using this conjunctural approach to making sense of technologically mediated intimacies. Perhaps the best way into this is to address the most immediate question that the current conjuncture raises for our project. What place will gay men's smartphone mediated intimacies occupy in a time of physical distancing, much like what Amanda was just talking about? In the UK, this question has already proven contentious, 
with leading sexual health organization, the Terence Higgins Trust, advocating abstinence from sex with people outside your household and encouraging different forms of digital intimacy instead. Early survey data from the London School of Health and Tropical Medicine has shown that during the very beginning of the lockdown in March and April, when the lockdown was most severe, about one quarter of the MSM surveyed were still hooking up. At the same time, there has been some intense moralizing on hookup app profiles and other social media platforms about gay men even entertaining the idea of having sex with someone outside your household. One of the things we hope to capture once the interviews start are the smartphone mediated tactics that differently situated gay men have used to negotiate this time of physical distancing and lockdown. Having said this, whilst looking at these smartphone mediated intimacies will remain central to our research focus, we're not only understanding coronavirus in terms of lockdown and physical distancing. Instead, we're understanding the pandemic as a conjunctural event that has social, cultural, economic, political, ideological, and technological effects on the broader historical context in which these smartphone mediated intimacies are taking place. So as an example, something that has become abundantly clear is that the pandemic has precipitated an economic crisis potentially similar in scale to the Great Depression. What even the medium term effects of this will be are currently difficult to imagine. What we're seeing in the UK are many businesses going into administration with a concomitant hemorrhaging of jobs. And this raises the following issues that we're currently thinking through. The first is the potential further closing down of queer spaces across the country. Partially drawing on Kane Race's formulation, something we're currently asking is what will be the balance between the communal and technological infrastructures of gay life within this new conjuncture? Since the emergence of gay dating sites, there has been a debate about what the relationship is between online dating and the parallel closing down of spaces where gay men had traditionally negotiated their intimate lives bars, clubs, and sex on premises venues in particular. Whichever position you take in this debate, one thing that is clear is that it's likely in the current crisis that more gay venues will close. So uh, a very well, famous restaurant in Soho called Balance already has. Once again, shifting the balance between the technological and the communal infrastructures of gay life, and in the project, we hope to capture this. Related to this is the rise of unemployment in a labor market that at least since the 2008 crisis has become more precarious, more poorly paid and less well protected. Already we're seeing that smartphone mediated intimacies have a place here. The project ran a, a webinar a couple of weeks back and one of our speakers, Mark Thompson, who's the co-founder of UK based black gay male organization, Black Out, said that some of the younger men associated with, the, uh, with Black Out were opening OnlyFans accounts in a bid to make some money in response to the economic crisis. For those who don't know, OnlyFans is a subscription-based social media platform where performers post sexual content for a price. So we're also interested in the role that platforms like OnlyFans, as well as other made mediated forms of sex work, will play in the pandemic or post-pandemic conjuncture. One perhaps unpredictable consequence of the pandemic has been the global explosion of the Black Lives Matter protests. In London, in the place of the annual Pride event that, like so many other mass summer gatherings, were closed to, to reduce the potential of COVID transmission, a Black Trans Lives Matter protest took place instead. And this represents a high point of a set of processes that has been occurring over at least the past five years, whereby what we might call intersectional questions have been raised in particular ways in LGBTQIA politics, especially in relation to trans folk and people of color, and in which the digital has been absolutely key. There's a related set of intimacy politics here, not least in relation to sexual racism on and offline, the decision for some people of color to only practice intimacy with other people of color as protection from this racism, and the various places that trans folk occupy in queer spaces of intimacy, where cis white gay men remain hegemonic. These issues have acquired an unexpected intensity in the current conjuncture, and again, we're interested in the place of the smartphone in this. There are also broader questions that we're thinking through. 
the delegitimization of right-wing populism after the spectacular inability of leaders like Bolsonaro, Trump, and the UK's Boris Johnson to handle the pandemic. The related re-legitimization of science and experts in British public life. The increase of the platformatization of everyday life and the subsequent growth of digital capitalism at this moment of uh, physical distancing and its consequences for social economic inequality. And in the UK specifically, the so-called end of neoliberal austerity, despite the government massively overinflating the money it claims it wants to spend on public services and funneling it into private corporations, often with direct links with the UK cabinet to do so. Neoliberalism perhaps by another name. These issues might not have any obvious or immediate connection to gay smartphone mediated intimacies. Um, however, one thing that using conjunctural analysis enables us to see is how seemingly disparate social phenomena are connected in complex and often unpredictable and revealing ways. So whilst we at the project are centrally preoccupied with digital intimacy, we believe there's a real benefit to placing these intimacies within the wider arrangement of social forces in which they are practiced. That benefit being a greater appreciation of the historical and political significance during a conjuncture in which gay and bisexual men's cultures of digital intimacy are once again beginning to prove contentious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie, that was excellent. Um, and um, I have lots of questions, but I would like to throw the floor open to the audience to get us started on the questions. Um, the way we're going to do it, we're going to do it via the chat box. And I was going to pause the recording, but I'm told that the chat box doesn't actually appear on the recording. So um, we can keep recording. And if we put this up online, we'll still just be able to hear from the speakers. And I will feed the questions to the speakers in a way that doesn't actually reveal the identities of any of our, any of our participants. So it all should be okay for the recording. And if it turns out not to be, we can edit before we put it up online. So um, with that in mind, if I look a bit funny, it's because I'm trying to read the chat box while also answering these questions. Let me change the gallery view. Okay, um, if anyone has questions, please use the chat box to, to type your message and I will feed that to any of our speakers. Just indicate in your question um, if there's one particular speaker you'd like to hear from. And just to get us started while people are busily typing their questions, um, I've got a few that I might start to start off with. Um, actually, this occurred to me while both Amanda and Jamie were speaking, but it's really just about the role of, so either of you, please feel free to jump in in response. Um, it's really about the role of text. Like it just strikes me that letters and writing and communication where people actually have to write down their thoughts or their feelings rather than speak them have, has a really long history in terms of intimacy um, and sexual and romantic connection. But do you think the text message and the kind of immediacy of the text message or online messenger um, has, has changed things or has opened up kind of new ways for people to, to be intimate? Um, yes, so there is certainly um, a good bit of research being done in that area. Um, so things like um, how long it takes someone to respond, um, if they respond quickly, if they respond with typos, um, if they respond sometimes but not other times, um, those are definitely related to differences in perception. So people perceive those those um, senders as less invested in the relationship. Um, people who use online dating and experience that tend to think, or um, more often tend to think that that person who's not responding as frequently or not responding at all might be committing infidelity in their relationship um, or doing something bad and that's why they um, aren't responding. Um, so there is a lot to be said for what, what these um, probably unintentional, possibly unintentional behaviors come off as and how people interpret them. Um, but there, I also did this, um, I did a three-part study a few years ago on the use of emojis in text. So um, there's a book called Dataclism by Christian Rudder, who's the, or who was the data scientist at OkCupid. And um, he reviews a bunch of data in that book. But 
one of the biggest things is that people um, more often respond to shorter messages, which um, I think definitely goes against what I would think. I would think that people would be more likely to respond to the longer messages that, um, you know, talk about what they've seen on people's bios and ask awful questions and things, but the shorter messages get responses. And so the hard part then becomes how do you express yourself and your personality and um, create a picture of yourself that um, conveys compatibility in just a few sentences. Um, and so my colleagues and I looked at emojis, which is just one character, to look at how that might impact things. And um, actually people who use emojis more often in online dating uh, platforms um, also had higher emotional intelligence. They were more um, uh, extroverted. They were more agreeable. Um, they had like higher levels of general. I remember of... reading that in the media. The media loved that. Yeah, <laughs> I, that, I think love people media. love an emoji. It's like the article that keeps giving, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, people who use emojis more often on the dating platforms also got more first dates, more second dates. Um, they had sex more often with the people that they met up with, and they were more likely to still be in contact um, over time. So um, certainly, I think that uh, texting is definitely different than what like writing handwritten letters used to be. Mm -hmm. I think it lost something there, but um, I think that... Uh, humans are good at adapting things to get to reach our goals and connecting is certainly a big goal for a lot of people. Jamie, did you have anything to add to that? You're on mute. Yeah. yeah I, I saw, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, just to echo what, um, what Amanda was saying. I mean, we did a focus group with five or four gay men and one bisexual man. Um, in London before coronavirus, so um, and that was something that came up. And one of the big, uh, well, certainly the thing that I, one of the discussion points I remember the most was um, what uh, Amanda referred to in terms of the response of whether someone responds to a text or not, and the enormous anxiety, and the kind of continuous focus on the blue ticks on a WhatsApp message and the constant, the spirals of anxiety that people would necessarily go into to the point where people turned it off. And it was something that generated a lot of discussion. And, um, and yeah, and also uh, similar to what Amanda was saying, you know, what does texting mean now? I mean, emojis were something that was talked about a lot. And that was, I think, point of contention is perhaps too strong a word. But there was certainly, um, we, we, we were kind of trying to, there was a pull within the focus group to talk about kind of, hooking up on Grindr and, and we were trying to say, well, what other ways, you know, what other sorts of intimacies are you practicing? And someone showed a meme emoji that his boyfriend had sent him during the focus group, a face with a kind of like kiss heart. And that, some people thought that was nauseating. Some people thought that was very sweet. And then the amount of emojis that you used, I mean, I think it, it seemed to undermine uh, a certain sense of masculinity, which still existed. And so, yes, I think that, I think often now we're thinking about, um, images and uh, sexting, uh, well, uh, nude images and uh, video conferencing, but texting and emojis are obviously a vital part of, of digital intimacies, certainly in that focus group. Yeah, I might just throw in one of the questions here from, from the audience and, and apologies to the audience. I might jump around a little bit for the, um, in terms of the order of the questions, but I'll, I'll do my best to get to everyone in the time that we have. But there is one question here where someone said, texting can clearly communicate boundaries because people are forced to be more explicit rather than rely on body language and socio-sexual socio scripts. Do you think that we can expect that people engaging with sexting, romantic texting during this time, which I assume to mean the time of, of COVID, will gain some skills in boundary making and communication that will then be transferable to face-to-face -to -face communication? Just a simple question, but, but do you think you learn something from, from texting about communication? Does it sort of teach you to communicate in a different way or help you open up in different ways or, or teach you something about boundaries? Um, I can only speculate, of course. Um, I think that um, beyond the uh, activity of writing out your feelings, I think that we might see, I think we might see some changes after COVID from having to talk this much without meeting in person. 
um, I think that uh, with a lot of online dating, people generally talk for um, just a handful of days before they meet in person, and then it's very much in person from then on. You know, you text about meeting up or whatever, but um, the focus is really on the in-person interaction. And I think that now with, with it not being safe to meet in person, um, now people are having to engage in a lot more um, conversation about their likes and dislikes and compatibility and all of these things that um, they would have had to discuss face to face, which might have been more awkward and might have been avoided more or might have come out later than it, um, than it is through text right now. Um, so I think that we might see some changes, some potentially positive beneficial changes in terms of um, people learning to communicate those things and then taking that with them. And when we, uh, you know, go back to normal, if that ever happens. Um, but I don't know if, I, I haven't seen any research looking at um, communication skills improving now that people are texting. My guess is that if that exists, it probably is negative. It would um, be an interesting study though. I can kind of, I can see where that could go. Yeah, I imagine that it might, there might be something out there with um, like younger people, like Gen Z people. Mm. And um, I know that I have seen some stuff looking at, um, like talking about how they, you know, shorthand everything. And it's like just a, a bunch of like random letters to anyone outside of their age range. My son um, walks around I, saying, saying LOL, which is actually the abbreviation for laugh out loud. I think that's quite common. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that uh, there certainly probably are communication changes, but I don't know if they're good. Um, yeah. So much is just different and somewhat incoherent to everyone else. Um, Amanda, I might follow on with you actually while you're speaking. Um, someone has said, has the incorporation of tech in dating influence sexual practices and behaviors through increased or decreased inhibitions or trust or mistrust in the in the technology does that make sense um a little bit uh sorry can you read that one more time so i think what they're saying is is they're really asking whether um the greater use of tech in sexual practices um particularly in the time of COVID, relative to your work um, has that actually changed people's um, sexual behaviours either through um, an increase or a decrease in inhibition? So are people more likely to reveal something of themselves or be more sexually explicit? And you did refer to people creating content, for example. Is that um, new? And is that then related to a trust or a mistrust or distrust in the technology itself? So I would interpret that to mean something like are people more inclined to trust the technology and therefore be less inhibited in terms of what they show or reveal about themselves? Um, I think from a sexual perspective, we um, not necessarily in my study, but there has been some um, evidence of that, at least in the US. So there's been um, a lot more people using OnlyFans, which is, um, which Jamie, I think, talked about briefly, um, which, you know, is... Um, a place where people can uh, share nude or sexual imagery and or whatever and get paid for it. Um, so there has been an uptick in that for, for sure. And there's also been an uptick in people who do things like um, cam sites, performing on cam for, um, for money or for some kind of um, compensation and sexual acts, nudity, etc. Um, as far as people being less inhibited and you know, sending more nudes and things like that. We did see an uptick in that, but I don't know if that, we don't have data to show if that means they sent nude imagery to like strangers or people they already had a relationship with, um, which I think certainly means different things in terms of um, inhibitions. Um, you can see how that would be, you have to have lower inhibitions to send a stranger a nude picture than to send someone that you're in a relationship with. Um, in our previous research, we did find that um, of people who do sex, about 75% of them usually sex with people that they have something established with. They know that person, they've had, probably have in-person sex with them, etc. Um, so people are generally less likely to send um, sexually explicit material to people that they don't know in that way. Um, the exception to that tends to be gay men. We've seen that a lot in our studies, that gay men will... Um, frequently be more likely to sex with, with people they don't know in person and send sexual material. 
Um, but I don't know, I don't know that we've seen that um, in general across our survey. Jamie, do you have anything you've wanted to add to that point? No. I must have done a perfect job. Thank you so much. You did a perfect <laughs> job. Thank you. Actually, it sort of leads into another question there that was raised for you, Jamie, and I think just ending on um, the sort of culture in which gay and bisexual men utilise these apps is potentially different to, to cultures um, of, in which other groups are using these apps, particularly as Amanda said, maybe there's less inhibition in a kind of um, culture among men who have sex with men and the use of dating apps. Um, but someone has raised a question for you, Jamie, asking, um, why did you focus on gay and bisexual men? Was there a difference between gay, gay and bisexual men in digital culture? And I assume that means relative to other people as well as a difference between gay men and bisexual men. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we, we, we are hoping to see what, how there might be differences kind of once we do the interviews. I mean, the reason that in well, the way that we designed the project around gay and bisexual men, was, uh, was initial discussions around using the term MSM, actually. And um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. And uh, the idea that there might be ostensibly straight men who um, are having sex with men that aren't necessarily kind of participating in these cultures, which we're kind of interested in, in kind of mapping, which uh, bisexual men might be as well as much as, as gay men. Um, so it was really around that is the decision to do that. I mean, whether there are differences, I'll wait and see. I mean, the focus group, there was a guy who identified as bisexual, but was very much used to run gay clubs, was very much embedded in the culture that we're interested in kind of looking at. Um, and yeah, in terms of, of the focus on gay and bisexual men, as opposed to other groups, I mean, there are definitely, um, you know, this is something we're involved in at the moment is trying to, to map what might be specific um, about kind of gay men's cultures or gay and bisexual men's cultures of intimacy. And certainly one of the things I think that, um, is, that we are kind of interested in is, um, I think, the, the normalization of non-monogamy. Um, I think that um, obviously non-monogamy is practiced by a whole range of different people, but it tends to be in other communities a kind of political choice. Um, whereas I think, uh, um, not always, but I think often they're kind of um, in poly kind of cultures, there's a much more kind of explicit reflection on the significance of what polyamory kind of means. Whereas I think that in metropolitan gay cultures, non kind of open non-monogamy is a kind of feature of kind of homonormative gay life as much as, you know, anything else. As, as and much do as you think the technologies changed that or shifted that or, or normalised that more so than it my, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe it's um, facilitated its the, the, the possibility of doing it. But again, it's, you know, understanding the technology within the kind of conjunctural shifts that are happening. So um, actually, you know, there were gay marriage was hugely contested in the early days of gay liberation, whereas um, for most young queer people now, uh, not queer people, young gay people, I mean, there are kind of differences in these terms, it's understood and, and the wider population as the kind of full stop of, of, of gay politics in some senses. So I want to look at the technology within a wider kind of culture where arguments around kind of monogamy and non-monogamy and, and what kind of gay politics should be advocating in terms of the politics of intimacy um, is arguing for. So yeah, I think the technology it definitely comes out of a culture where um, open non-monogamy is um, and more forms of public. That's the other kind of feature which I think is important. I think gay men's um, kind of lives, uh, cultures of intimacy have a much more public dimension. This is something that Michael Warner and Lauren Berlant were writing about kind of 20 years ago. So there, is, there, are, there are distinct features, I think, not that these are exclusive to gay and bisexual men, um, and but the, the are kind of, uh, there were greater tendencies within the culture, which, you know, the, the technology, it's a grinder and hookup app culture, for instance, comes out of a public cruising culture, comes out of a culture where there is a greater emphasis on or, or openness around non-monogamy. And so, mm. yeah. So in a way that wouldn't be possible or it wouldn't have sort of developed in such a way if there hadn't been that culture. In fact, yeah. do you think in a way Tinder was almost modelled on Grindr? Like it almost 
sort of borrowed from what had been created through gay culture and through Grindr. I mean, quite, I mean, I, I'd need to look into it more, but quite possibly there might be people who do research on Tinder that can speak better to that than me. But I mean, it also seems to me that, you know, the affordances of Tinder are slightly different to the affordances of Grindr and the cultures that have developed around them, I think, are slightly different when mm. it's... Um, and certainly the way gay men use Tinder is different to the way they use Grindr. Um, so yes, there are parallels and it seems that might be the case, but I think there are also interesting differences that, you know, we, we would need to think about. Yeah, Amanda, you were nodding at that. Did you have something to add? Yeah, when Grindr um, emerged on the market and became popular, they released an, a heterosexual version called Blender, and it crashed and burned because women did, women did not want to meet. Women did not want men to know okay. that they were you know, 550 feet away or whatever. We weren't ready for that. Um, yeah. So it took a while for Tinder to to uh, to get going for people for non-gay and bisexual men to wanna engage with that kind of technology. Sorry, I'm just fielding the question that just came in. Just give me a second here. Um, I actually had a question that I think might relate to this one that's just came in. Um, and I'm not quite sure if it's, if it's for Suzanne or Jamie. So again, feel free, both of you to jump in. Um, and I'm not quite sure if it makes sense, but I'm going to give it a go. So Suzanne, when you were speaking, you were talking about um, the ways in which technologies materialise particular types of moralities. Um, and, and I was sort of reflecting on that while Jamie was speaking and just wondering how these sort of new digital media technologies and dating apps have actually materialised different forms of sexual morality. Does, does that make sense? It's sort of related to what we were just talking about. Yeah, so I mean... Any thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I guess um, listening um, as I have been... Um, and sort of coming at these issues fresh. So I'm not going to answer your question because I'm not qualified really. I don't, not my area <laughs> and so I'd be guessing. Right <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess the sorts of questions that come up for me coming from the perspective I sort of um, articulated in my um, comments um, are to do with whether there's room in our analyses for thinking also about the ways technologies can change us mm. um, so so that i mean and i think that's going to be there but I, it always you know comes into my mind if whenever we say we're using a technology or we're utilizing it or um you know that we're doing um actively doing things to um achieve a specific end i mean this is the sort of stuff that latour talked about um, saying that um, that's all there, but there's also a lot to be um, identified if we think about the relations as messier than that and, and we think about um, the, the ways in which technologies that we've made can also make us or use us to create unpredictable ends and um, to, to, so it's a kind of, I guess, um, it's a way of sort of um, wanting to just um, experimentally decenter the, um, the sort of human agent as the user of technology and to see what else comes up as an effect of the technology um, that, is, that is sort of outside the scope of, of the intended um, um, use of the technology um, and also to kind of think about the ways um, the technology might um, have multiple different effects for different people and so if we disaggregate a kind of overall effect of um, something like increasing or decreased loneliness I you know first thing I ask myself because of the kind this kind of sense of the multiple effects is you know, might a technology increase feelings of loneliness for some people and decrease feelings of loneliness for other people? And that's the sense in which the technology can't guarantee an outcome if, if that's um, happening. It just, um, it can afford certain um, uh, effects but um, can't um, determine them. So I guess um, Blender, not... Um, not um, being a huge success is one of those, uh, possibly one of those examples. But yeah, so for me, it's sort of, it, it, um, 
it's a really interesting area that raises a lot of questions about um, who, you know, causal relations essentially and um, the subjects and objects of effects, you know, who's doing what to whom, how and with what effects and, and kind of mixing that around and thinking about what things might become visible if we do. And actually, I think following from that in a way, and, and this is open to all speakers, someone's asked a question, thinking of the affordances of the technologies in Suzanne's framing of the term, um, is sexuality evolving during COVID-19? So has anyone found any surprising or innovative, innovative or hitherto not seen uses of technologies in this time? Or even not in this time, I, I would I'd probably extend that to include recent times or you know, has the evolution of Grinder and Tinder and is it Blender or Brenda? Or Brenda, anyway, it was a <laughs> one of those. What was it? Blend, Blender. Blender with an L. Yeah. I mean, has, has all that sort of had any unexpected impacts on, on sexual cultures or sexuality? Um, I don't know the answer to that question other than um, what we've been collecting about new additions. Uh, we do have some um, planned uh, new items for our upcoming waves, looking at um, whether or not people feel that um, aspects of their sexual identity have changed, um, whether or not they're starting to explore, um, you know, different avenues, different genders, different um, just different things in general, um, and whether or not that's affecting the way that they think about themselves, the way they think about their orientation, um, and what they might be interested in exploring after lockdown. But I don't, um, I don't have the data for that currently. I'm, I'm hoping that it shows something interesting and something that, you know, shows that people are um, going to be more open in, in real life once we can go back to whatever normal will be. But that's, of course, only speculative at this point. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, we were hoping to start doing the interview soon, so I'm not entirely sure, but I can speak kind of anecdotally about sort of different behaviours that, you know, friends and, you know, networks have been engaging in. And, you know, Amanda's findings resonated a lot for me with what I know of the kind of gay men that I've been speaking to. Um, and the, um, certainly the very beginning of the lockdown, um, much, there were much more kind of what traditionally we understand as intimate conversations happening over um, over Grindr and those hookup apps, as opposed to the more kind of transactional ones. Um, and I mean, and but yeah, and three quarters of gay men uh, in that, you know, I talked about the quarter that continued to hook up despite um, the advice to kind of stay at home. And, but you know, three quarters didn't. Um, and so there were more time kind of spent on Grindr, which Grindr was probably happy about because they don't care if you hook up or not, they just want you to continue to generate kind of traffic and, and data and whatever. Um, and obviously there's the, um, in terms of more public forms of sex, you know, the kind of sex on premises venues are closed. And I think we'll close for a very, very long time. I can't see, there's, there's no way of opening them in a safe way, I don't think. Although there are some places in the UK that are trying to. Um, the kind of wider use of open air spaces to kind of have sex. Uh, what that means in the long term in terms of um, uh, long term transformations in sexuality and the place of the digital, I don't know. Um, you know, I think there's also a real yearning to get back to kind of pre pandemic life. So, um, and in some way, I, we don't know when that's going to be possible. So, I don't know how long, you know, this new configuration of the digital, the communal, um, is going to be kind of you know how long this conjuncture will last for and what the kind of effects of it will be afterwards but but certainly yes in the immediate kind of severe kind of most severe part of lockdown there were definitely changes in sexual practice and and the place that the digital and just a quick another one is that um sex on premises when you started to run zoom um events for their patrons although how that remediates uh, in real life sex on premises venue i'm not entirely sure but uh, they and, that, and i've seen commercial ones that continue to do that so perhaps that will be a long I, I don't know i don't know i actually did read an article it was a newspaper article where they were reporting on or they were interviewing people who'd attended these online sex parties 
Um, and they were interviewing one woman about her experience of that. And she had been to in real life ones. And she was saying, oh, she was quite fascinated to discover that when she um, logged into this online sex party and she had no idea what was going to happen and how it was going to pan out and what it was going to be like, she had the same feelings of anticipation and excitement as walking into a physical venue. Um, and she was quite intrigued by that, by that experience of the online sort of replicating um, some of her emotional experiences that she would expect in real life. Whether or not that played out, I mean, who knows? It was one person in a media article, but I thought that was sort of an interesting question in itself. Um, and actually, um, another question I had for Amanda, which I wrote down and I can't find where I wrote it, so I have to try and remember. But it was really about loneliness and whether you think that um, technologies, I think compensate is the wrong word, but, but can technologies kind of intervene in loneliness in a meaningful way? Or like Suzanne suggested, are they also um, potentially detracting from it from some people? Like what is the role of technology in loneliness, given that such a sort of, it's a, there's a big focus in the world at the moment on loneliness and overcoming loneliness? Yeah, loneliness is um, quite a, a big deal that the estimates are that one in three adults in all industrialized countries suffer from loneliness and it has pretty, um, pretty extensive long term effects like earlier onset of Alzheimer's and um, shortened lifespans, etc. Um, as far as loneliness and technology, it's hard because the prior literature has all been focused or at least mostly has been focused on um, face to face interactions. So measuring face to face interaction and relating that to loneliness. And then all of the interventions are focused on increasing face to face interactions. And so now that we're in the situation where that's not um, feasible, um, it's very much sort of a scramble isn't the right word, but it's it's definitely um, something that's quite important for us to figure out quickly, I think. And that's why I was really interested in, in um, starting the study as soon as we went into lockdown and trying to follow it over time. Um, it seems from our data that people who are lonelier were at least attempting to try and find a little more emotional connection on the online dating platforms. Um, just from a few questions that we have in the data that I didn't present today. Um, but that was really only at T1 and they seem to have um, uh, stopped doing that. You know, it, it seems to be, it was prevalent at T1, but not necessarily at any other wave. You um, think it's and, kind of Zoom fatigue or text yeah, fatigue? Maybe, or, you know, maybe because, like we found that um, people, people were reporting that others were generally more interested in sex than emotions. Maybe they, or emotional connection, maybe they, um, you know, felt that it wasn't fulfilling that need and turned mm. away from it. Yeah. Um, or stopped seeking, trying to seek that. Um, as far as uh, technological connections with people that you already know that you're not trying to date, um, certainly I would hope that, you know, FaceTiming and Zooming with people that you love and care about would bring about, um, you know, positive benefits, but I don't personally know of any um, studies looking at that. Um, yeah. I, know that, I know that at least in the US, they are trying to um, incorporate that in um, nursing homes and um, centers for the elderly so that they can continue to stay in contact with their family now that um, visitors aren't allowed to go there. Um, but I don't know any, um, any like any data that really shows, um, you know, compared to face to face interactions, whether or not that that's equally beneficial or close. Yeah, um, I certainly hope so. And um, that's certainly uh, an outcome that my colleagues and I hope to get to to figure out how how people can harness technology to create these meaningful connections that will uh, I think I did sorry to interrupt I think I did read in one of your studies that people reported um, there was a sense of some emotional satisfaction from things like webcamming sex on yeah. the webcam yeah, um, we do have the, sorry I totally for, I blanked on that one because it's not not necessarily um, you know, people during COVID, um, but we did conduct a study in the fall on, um, it was a nationally representative study of Americans, but we were really interested in looking at um, sex tech and mm -hmm. a lot of our questions were focused on webcamming because it's certainly a rising industry and it's a way of using technology to connect with someone else in real time rather than 
you know, viewing pornography or leaving messages for people or whatever. Mm. Um, you can interact with them, you can talk to them, they talk to you, etc. cetera. Um, and some of the websites have, um, you know, put up statistics about people coming there, not just for sex. And so we were really interested in that. And we found that um, uh, of people who do go to, who do visit camming sites, who do watch um, performers and, um, you know, interact with them in some capacity, um, one in three of them reported feeling a personal connection and emotional connection with oh. the performer. And they reported that it took about three visits with that performer to feel that connection. Um, and for those who did feel the connection, um, we asked about, you know, like um, sexual gratification, emotional gratification, social support. And um, they actually reported receiving equal amounts of emotional and sexual gratification, um, which was pretty interesting to us considering these are typically thought of as explicitly sexual spaces um, that you, you know, very transactional, you pay for nudity or sexual acts and then you log off, right? Mm. Uh, but it seems that people are actually forming uh, more long-term connections with performers. And um, they also reported higher levels of social support. And for those people who did, who did create um, a connection with the model, they also reported lower loneliness than people who didn't. Um, and they reported um, um, just various um, metrics of feeling supported, feeling um, emotionally close, feeling like they had someone to turn to. Mm. Mm, so there, there is something to be said for um, technological spaces that we think are strictly for sex. Um, it, it seems that those actually might be um, outlets for more than just that, for, for different kinds of connection, different kinds of relationships than we just typically think of. Um, yeah. And we're just in the starting stages of exploring that. Yes, just, yeah, just, just sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, you, you speak, Suzanne, you speak. Then. Oh, well, okay. I just, um, I was curious because did you say about one third of, of people? One third of people who do go to camming sites and yeah, and what and what about the others? What did they say about the experience? The two thirds. So the two thirds reported um, they they had not they had not felt that they had formed any kind of emotional or personal connection with their performer. Um, unfortunately, we didn't ask this, but it maybe that those people are not um, are more into novelty seeking. They seek. They watch several performers. They don't necessarily, um, you know, hook onto one or um, or necessarily want to find any kind of connection like that. They're likely just exploring their sexuality and trying to get sexual gratification. Um, they reported equal amounts of sexual gratification as those who did feel a personal connection. There was no difference there. Um, it's just that for one third of people, it's also adding, it's giving a different benefit as well. So, so yeah, I mean, I just I mean, speaking a bit to the first question, but also on, on what you, know, you guys have just been saying, I mean, um, one of, I mean, this question of loneliness and, and technology, I think, you know, one of the very useful ways um, that's helped us think about what intimacy means is, I referred already to Lauren Balan and Michael Warner, and Lauren Balan um, kind of defines intimacy as, um, in a kind of very influential essay that she wrote again 20 years ago it was um, connections we depend on for living um, which is a kind of different um, interpretation of what intimacy is if the more traditional kind of notions of intimacy are kind of uh, private private thoughts and feelings shared between uh, intimate partners in a kind of private space um, and and so that's a much more kind of expansive way of imagining what intimacy is and can incorporate an awful lot. And so I was really appreciative of Suzanne's um, examples of intimacy yeah. because I mean, those are not, um, uh, you know, very persuasive examples of what intimacy is and, and the relationship between intimacy and technology. Um, and so, yeah, and so I think, you know, we're in an interesting moment in, in that respect because, um, uh, you know, we uh, certainly in the mo more severe kind of moment of lockdown, I mean, essentially, we're being asked to rely on these digital forms of intimacy, which, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, were always, again, using a term from 
uh, science and technology studies were always entangled with more other sort of physical forms of intimacy. In, in one wasn't necessarily better than the other. In our, in our focus group, people talked about a lot of different intimacies and they also talked exactly about what Amanda's talking about, about having an intimate connection, you know, in purely mediated ways and whether that was to a particular porn performer in more traditional studio porn or an OnlyFans porn, or whether that was a kind of someone they'd been chatting to on Grindr, for instance, for a number of months that had never met, but had given, you know, had become a connection they had depended on for living in a minor or major way. Um, but, um, and so I think a lot of the debate now is around what place technology has in mediating, you know, and what, what we're talking about. Mm. And, and clearly it's, 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 been, it's been vital, but I think it's also important, you know, not to lose sight of, um, you know, and I don't think anybody is, of the, of the physical and in real life intimacies that are being lost. Uh, you know, a friend of mine talked about at the beginning of lockdown that he just missed, he missed being touched. He's a single person that lives alone and it wasn't that he missed having sex or hooking up or being promiscuous. It was, it was literally having his hair stroked by someone. Mm. Um, and similarly, I saw someone today, a couple of days ago, um, say that he went to the barber for the first time in lockdown and you know there is a particular type of intimacy of going to a barber and having someone that close to you and that was a connection in some ways he depended on for living again maybe in a minor way but I mean he's missing that too and so that entanglement of, of the digital and the actual I don't, I'm not sure how useful necessarily those separations are but um, but you know this is what's you know lockdown is is that's happening in lockdown and I guess you know this is the sorts of things that we're thinking through those entanglement yeah thank you actually that's we're at time and that's a really nice way to end Suzanne is there anything you'd like to add to what Jamie just said as a no I think that was great actually I really appreciate that thank you and Amanda was there any last thoughts that you'd like to share no I think he summed it up perfectly um I agree thank you Jamie that was that was actually a very pertinent um, and lovely way to end. I'm just sharing my screen again. I don't know if people can see that. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that um, as, as a sort of accompaniment to this seminar, we've, we've put together a special edition of a local journal called Bent Street, so Bent Street 4.1. Um, and in that journal, um, we are publishing interviews that we did with each of the three speakers today, so with Jamie, Suzanne and Amanda. Um, and we also are publishing a collection of, uh, sort of a creative collection of essays and first person accounts and, and fiction and poetry and artwork related to this theme of, of technology um, and intimacy at a distance. Um, so that will be available quite soon, I think a couple more weeks and we'll, we'll get that out. Um, all of the, the, the content is available online. Um, but you can also purchase hard copies. So we'll send um, an email link out actually to the, to the list of people who attended today to let you know when that's available. And I would just like to end by really um, thanking our speakers. It was a really interesting session and I, and I really, well, that screen just makes me go red, so I'm gonna turn that off. Um, I really, how do I stop sharing? Stop sharing that. Um, I, I really appreciate you giving up your time. I know that actually, um, despite the subject, actually speaking into a computer is an incredibly hard thing to do, uh, particularly at 1.30am or whatever time it is for you now, Amanda. <laughs> I hope you can go and get some sleep. And Jamie, thank you for getting up. <laughs> what time is it? Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, what time is it for you now? Super early. It's 6.30. Yeah. Great. So you, you get to start your day. Yeah. Amanda, you get to go to bed. And Suzanne, you can go and have a cup of afternoon tea. <laughs> yeah, thanks to everyone from me as well. Yeah, it was really great. And I'd also just like to add, it's really lovely to connect these three um, research centres. So, so particularly Archers and Kinsey, we have such a long shared history. And um, it's really lovely actually to have you both in this, this room uh, to make a connection between Archers and Kinsey and also to bring Jamie's work into that because you really are leading the way in a lot of this research on digital intimacy. So thank you again and thank you for everyone who attended um, and hopefully we can all kind of stay in touch. That would be really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, Jane. Yeah, Jane. I'm, ju I'm just going to.
push, push pause on 